Well, good morning. So good to be together. And um, uh, just by way of introduction, my name is Richard Lucas. My wife's name is, is Tina. And um, I'm so thankful, we are so thankful as a couple to be part of a church that loves and celebrates marriage and values the importance of it. And each of the speakers that you're hearing from today, including those on the panel, uh, all have uh, good marriages that are seeking to honor the Lord and they're growing in Christ-like love for each other. And, you know, and myself, uh, my wife and I, we've benefited over the years from the example of married couples that are ahead of us, sometimes even married couples that have been married less than us. And we have had godly mentors in our life just pouring us and speaking to us through things like conferences, through sitting across uh, at a restaurant or in our living room or when there's nothing major going on or there's a big problem going on, whatever the case is, it's benefited us. And uh, this month, uh, as Austin alluded to, uh, we, my wife and I celebrate 18 years of marriage and it's hard to believe how fast it's, it's gone by. Um, I remember when I was being a newlywed and we had moved to uh, the seminary and there was a bunch of new married couples there and we went to this marriage uh, retreat that our church put on at the time we were married like a year and a half or something like that. And there's this other couple there that, a couple couples that were married like 10 years. We're like, whoa, 10 years. Can you believe 10 years of marriage? Well, now we've married 18 years. And uh, I knew, my wife and I, we've known each other for a long time. I knew since early on in high school that I wanted to marry her. And um, I didn't tell her that and she didn't know that and she didn't feel the same way yet. <laughs> we were working on that. But at age 19, we got engaged. At age 20, we got married. And I have no regrets, no regrets getting married and being married 18 years. In fact, I remember talking to friends who were like, oh man, you're missing the single life, the bachelor pad life. And I'm like, oh really? I mean, you like making your own lunch and <laughs> doing your own laundry and being by yourself at night? Okay. But <laughs> uh, you know, God has a plan and a purpose for singleness and everyone gets married at different times, but I don't regret a single day I've, I've been married. And I'm so thankful that uh, the Lord has given me someone to call my wife someone that I love and cherish, someone that loves and cherishes me, someone that I can share joys and pains with, someone that I can laugh and cry with, and someone I can just live life with. And I hope that's uh, how you think of your spouse and your marriage partner, your husband, your wife. And, uh, and it really is a blessing to be married. And I, I pray that even after this conference together today that you'll just be more excited about being married and being in a marriage and having a husband or a wife. Um, I just want to read one verse before we pray and begin, and um, we're going to go back to Ephesians 5, and uh, the conference is kind of designed, uh, built in to have repetition. Uh, that's on purpose because um, the Bible has a few concentrated verses on marriage, and there's a lot of overlap between what we need to say because it's all relevant, and usually we need to hear it more than once, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here if we only need to hear it once. So there's going to be some overlap between each of our talks, except for Sean's talk. He's talking on sex, and we'll just let him handle that all by himself. Um, we don't. <laughs> um, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I'm just going to read one verse, and I'll pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. It's at the end of the chapter. He kind of closed with this. Uh, verse 32. Ephesians 5, 32. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church refers to Christ and the church. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are a blessed people to be able to be here tonight, uh, this morning and today and this afternoon to hear this instruction from your word and to be able to be at a conference that celebrates marriage. And I pray, God, for all those in the audience. Um, we come here in different stages of life. Some here are not married. Some are struggling with their marriage. Some are wondering if marriage is worth continuing. Some are doing really well in their marriage, but they need some help. And some um, are wondering whether or not marriage is even worth it in the first place. I don't know what all the purpose is, Father, but I pray that in our time together, both now and in this afternoon, that you would just bring clarity from your word, that you would help us to get a greater love for Jesus Christ as a result of our time together and a result, more importantly, of our marriage. I pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's lots of topics you can talk about at a marriage conference. And um, when it comes to marriage in the Bible, there's lots of different angles you can take and ways you can go about it. And there's lots of topics you'd expect to be covered at a marriage conference. You know, things like 
we just heard the purpose of marriage or the importance of marriage or topics like conflict resolution, which we're gonna hear about, or good communication and even intimacy in marriage all make sense when you think about, yeah, the things we should talk about when we're talking about marriage and we go to a conference, a Bible conference on marriage. Um, so then why this topic? Why talk about the gospel in marriage? I mean, sure, it's important that you be a Christian, but marriage is not just for Christians, right? Marriage is a creation ordinance, not just a church ordinance. So marriage is for everybody, whether a Christian or not. And so we think it's actually a good thing for unbelievers to be married rather than just living together. But beyond all that, I think we, those that are here tonight, uh, this morning, would recognize that, well, it's God's design that people be following the Lord and following him in salvation and following him in marriage. So you should be a Christian when you get married, or a Christian should only marry a Christian. So that makes sense when you think about the gospel and marriage. But when we talk about the gospel and marriage, we actually mean something more. Yes, it's important to be a Christian. We're kind of assuming that a little bit, although I want to talk about that. So then why this topic? Why the gospel and daily marriage? Well, when we hear the word gospel, it depends what you think you mean by that. When the Bible means gospel, it, a lot of people think it just means, well, the plan of salvation, how you can get to heaven. Well, it does mean that, but it means more than that. It, that's just one piece of all of the good news that the Bible means when it talks about the gospel. You see, the gospel is not just how you're saved, but it's also how you're sanctified. The gospel is not just for sinners. The gospel is also for saints. The gospel is not just how you get into the Christian life. The gospel is also how you live the Christian life. The gospel is not just the diving board that you jump into to get in the pool of the Christian life. It's actually the pool that you swim in. You never leave the gospel. You only go deeper into the gospel. So the gospel transforms all of life. And the gospel is transforming all of life. It's certainly transforming the most, one of the most important aspects of your life, which is your marriage. The gospel is meant to fundamentally change who you are and what you do. Because of the gospel, you get a new identity and you get a new job. And it changes what you do and it changes who you are. And so we need to freshly remind ourselves of the gospel every day. We need to freshly remember the gospel and it's what it says about who we are and what we do. And we also need to freshly draw on gospel graces to obey and to follow in who we are and what we do. So what I want to talk about in our time together and the gospel and daily marriage is I want to talk about five things we need to remember about the gospel every day. Five things the Bible does when it refocuses our identity. It changes who we are and it informs what we do. And we need to draw freshly on that power every day. And if we keep these five remember, remembrances, these five reminders, because of the gospel, it'll help us to live in a way that honors the Lord in great harmony and joy with our spouse. So, five things we're to remember. Because of the gospel, because of the gospel, every day you need to remember that, number one, you married a sinner. You married a sinner. The gospel is only for sinners. Now, the Bible says clear that no one is righteous, all of sin. So you say, well, yeah, I know, we're all sinners. But the gospel, the reason this is different for the gospel is that the Bible clearly establishes that everyone's a, gospel, uh, everyone's a sinner, but not everyone acknowledges they're a sinner. That's kind of the problem. The first step in embracing the gospel is embracing that you need the gospel. It's embracing that you are a sinner. Mark 2, verse 17, Jesus says, I did not come to heal the well. People that aren't sick don't need a doctor. People that are righteous don't need a savior. He says, I came to heal sick sinners, not righteous well people. So you don't think you need Jesus if you don't think that you're a sinner and desperately, desperately in need of Christ. So here's how this makes a difference in your marriage. You married a sinner. 
Therefore, you should expect your spouse, your husband, your wife, to sin against you. You should expect them to sin against you. And don't be surprised by that when they do. And not only that, but they married a sinner too. And you're going to be sinning against them. And it's not like, well, yeah, every once in a while, like once a month, I might sin against them. No, I think that's probably not, not accurate. My guess is that every day you're being sinned against and you're sinning against them. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Yes, we don't want to sin. And yes, we want to grow in holiness. And through the gospel, we can grow in that. We'll talk about that. But the reality is, we shouldn't be surprised that we'll be sinned against. And so here's how this manifests itself. I think that oftentimes, because we're surprised that this person that we've made a covenant bond with, and we've shared vows with, and we love, and we sleep with, and we have kids together, we're surprised that they sin against us. And we're like shocked about it. And we're like easily offended. And then we hold grudges. Ugh, how, how dare you talk to me like that? Why would you do that? Well, they're, they're doing it because they're a sinner. And you knew that when you married them. And they knew that about you when they said, I do, to you as a sinner as well. So we should expect that sin is part of marriage. And if sin is part of marriage, how do we deal with it in marriage? We can't just ignore it. We have to have the biblical solution to deal with it. Now, there's some sins in marriage that should never be. Some sins in marriage that should never be. Sin like adultery. The ultimate betrayal in a marriage. Some of you have faced that in your marriage. Praise God that his word has something to say to that. And there's forgiveness offered. And there's a fresh reminder that all of us, biblically speaking, are spiritual adulterers to God himself. As we've run after other idols in our own hearts, if not in practice. And so just as we sought forgiveness in Jesus because of our spiritual adultery, even those of you that have experienced adultery can find forgiveness. But even apart from those big sins, there's a whole lot of other little sins that happen every day. And they're just a result of living on this side of the fall. On the back side of Genesis 3, all of us live in a fallen world and we're sinning against each other all the time. And so, as Pastor Heath said, marriage is hard work. If you're wondering, why, why is marriage hard? I mean, I love this person. Like, we actually like spending time together. I was, like, really excited to get married. And now it's like, it's, like, hard. Why is it hard? It shouldn't be hard. No, it is hard. Because you married a sinner. And they married one, too. That's why it's hard. That's why it takes work. That's why it's not easy. Because it takes effort. Because you've got two sinners living together. Two sinners trying to do life together. And you're sinning against each other, not just other people, every day. And so one way this manifests itself is something as simple as communication. I mean, you think to yourself, why, why is it so hard just to like download information with another person? Well, because you're not just like sending them an email with like FYI of what happened today. You're, you're, you're trying to connect with them and you are sharing your life together and you want to be united in heart and mind together. And so communication is imperfect, and you have to work to understand each other. And it's hard work to understand each other. I mean, I, my wife and I, we, um, uh, I shared this with some of the young couples uh, last week. We, we talked a lot before we got married. In fact, even starting in high school, before we were even had a romantic relationship of any sort, we, we talked every day in the phone almost for hours. I'm not saying that was the best thing to do, and I don't know what our parents were doing thinking, but we, we talked all the time. And so I assumed... Shoot, I remember hearing in like premarital counseling how like you need good communication habits and how hard it is to communicate. And I hear people like talk to marriage counselors. Oh yeah, people have communication problems. You go to marriage conference, they have whole seminars on communication. I'm like, what's wrong with people? They don't know how to talk to each other. Like that's not gonna be our problem. We talk all the time. Surely this is gonna be easy when it gets to communication. And it probably took us about 10, 11 years into our marriage before we realized that we weren't very good at it. It took me that, that long to figure that out. And it was through my wife being patient with me and some godly mentors like, yeah, I don't think you're as good at communicating with each other as you think you are. I'm like, what? what are you talking about? We talk all the time. See, I've mistook talking to her and her talking to me and us exchanging words as communication. But the difference was I didn't really understand her. And even more than just understanding her, uh, she wasn't convinced that I understood her. See, what I found out in my marriage is that the reason my wife wanted to keep talking about something 
over and over again. I'm like, hey, we already talked about this. I got it. We're good. I don't, we don't need to talk about it anymore. And I, I kind of would get frustrated, and I'd, and I'd kind of like, hey, we don't need to bring that back up, and I'd dismiss her. The reason she felt that way and wanted to keep bringing it up and the reason she felt an angst about it is because she wasn't convinced that I understood her. It wasn't good enough for me just to say, hey, I got this, I understand. M- my simple affirmation of that didn't satisfy her. She wanted to be convinced that I understood her. And that made all the difference once she was convinced that, okay, you know what, we might be heading in a different direction, but now I know that he understands me. Not only that he understands me, but another problem in our marriage is that she wasn't convinced that I had her best interest in mind, that I was really dying to self, as Pastor Heath said. And so that just, that just muddles up all the communication right there. If she doesn't think I understand her, and she doesn't think I have her best interest in mind, then yeah, we're going to be grinding the gears every day. The Lord helped us with that, praise the Lord. And one of the things is just a simple tool of uh, just communication is um, uh, she would say something, hey, um, here's, I'm upset about something, or this is bothering me, or I'm feeling attention, and I would just, okay, you know, before I respond or react or try to bring a solution, I would just ask her, okay, so let me just make sure I understand what you're saying, and I'd repeat back to what I said. So you're saying this. She's like, no, why do you think that? I don't know, I just said the exact same word you just said. No, you're misunderstanding me. Okay, all right. And then I have to ask some more questions and more questions. And it just took a while to draw her out for me to even understand what she's even trying to say. But, uh, praise the Lord, um, we have gotten better at that. We're not perfect by any means, but we've gotten better at that. And so it's a, it's a test of whether or not she's feeling settled that I understand her, whether or not she keeps bringing it up again. And she feels convinced that I understand her. So communication is hard work because I'm a sinner. And she's a sinner, and we're sinning against each other. And because we sin against each other regularly, um, we need um, both forgiveness and forbearance. Let me show you another verse here, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Hopefully you've thought about forgiveness, but this other category of forbearance is really helpful in marriage. Look at verses uh, 12 and 13. Colossians chapter 3. Here Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then he says this, bearing with one another, and if one has to complain against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So he's separating out two different categories. The first category is bearing with one another, and then he says, and if one has to complain against another, forgiving each other. So not everything rises to the category of needing forgiveness. Some things are just in the category of forbearance. And if you can leave more things in the category of forbearance, then it makes it easier when you have to go to the category of forgiveness. I remember figuring this, so, so what do we mean by forbearance? Well, sometimes when you live with another person, they just have some things they do that just kind of annoy you a little bit, okay? They're just annoying habits. Um, and you don't understand why they're doing it, but you can just be okay with it. I remember we were, on our, we were just getting back to our honeymoon. We just got married, and we were, we were, we were both living in like a, a dorm, uh, a, you know, a, a, a college dorm. We were moving into an apartment together, and all I had was my little college tray of utilities that, you know, you, have to, you couldn't keep in the room because guys do all kinds of gross stuff in a college bathroom that like 20 guys use. So you keep it in your room, and you bring it out and use it. And so, hey, now I don't have to bring my tray back and forth. So I just went into the bathroom, and like the whole bathroom had all these open cabinets. I just picked one little spot. I just put my stuff there, and I walked out. And I was like, hey, you can have the rest of the space. I don't need any of it. I just need that one little spot. Like, okay, and I go off, and I'm setting up something else in the apartment. I come back five minutes later, and all of my toiletries are all over the living room floor. I'm like, what's going on here? She's like, oh, I didn't want them there. <laughs> well, why was that a problem? I, you know, and the thing is, I, I could have, I could have, I could have ratcheted it up, and I could have put that in a sin category. You don't love me. You're not being selfless. You're only thinking of yourself and start accusing her of sins. But I didn't have to do that. I could have just understood, you know what? She just has different preferences. She does things differently than me. She has different habits, and I can just go along with it, and I can just forbear with her differences. Because the truth is, she's forbearing with me all the time. You know, I mean, whatever it is, I don't know. Um, maybe, she, maybe your wife doesn't like the way you chew food, okay? Or, or, or maybe, you know, for me, it's, um, you know, my wife likes keeping our bedroom kind of tidy. And for me, I, I just don't, um, I, you know, I, 
I only have like five shirts and two pairs of pants I wear like every day. So why, why go all the effort of folding them up and putting them in a hanger and putting them in the closet? Just keep them out in a chair, you know? And so I just take them off and I put them there. And then the next day I put them back on or the next one or whatever. They rotate around. And, you know, once a week or two or so, I'll, I'll clean them up. Someone's going to come over the house. But she, she really likes them, like, put away every night into the closet. Uh, that doesn't happen that often. And uh, sometimes she does it for me. Usually she just kind of neatens up the pile and puts it somewhere. But she's just, she's just forbearing with me and my annoying little habits. And she could say, oh my gosh, why doesn't he love me? I told him I like a neat bedroom. I told him he, uh, I prefer him to do this. And he just, he just didn't even think about me. He's thinking about himself. Well, okay, yes, I, I, I do want to grow as a servant. I want to be more thoughtful of my wife. I want to do better at that. But sometimes I'm just not thinking about it. I'm just, I'm just running to the next thing and I just throw my stuff down. And by her just agreeing to just forbear and just accept my differences, it just makes it so much easier. It just makes it so much easier. So just forbear with each other. Whatever the thing is in your marriage, you know what those are. Right? The way you load the dishwasher, or the way you, you walk the dog, or the way you whatever. Forbear with each other. Bearing with one another. Just part of living together when two sinners are just doing life together. But there are times when you actually are sinning each other, and then it ratchets it up. And then the next part of the verse comes in handy. Verse 13. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So you have to be quick to admit your sin. Quick to seek forgiveness of the other person. Don't hold on to that. Don't go to this cold war where you just, you, 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 give, your, you give your spouse the silent treatment. You, you know what that is? That, that's not repentance. That's making them do penance. That, that, that's, that's not what we believe the Bible teaches. It's like, you know what, fine. I forgive you. We're okay right now, but I just don't want to talk to you right now. So I'm just going to like build up this wall and um, I'm going to make you pay for it relationally for a little while. And I'm making you earn back your status before me. Well, that's just penance. That's not repentance. That's not forgiveness. So seek for repentance and offer forgiveness quickly. God doesn't hold grudges against you. That's what he says right here. Forgive each other as you've been forgiven. Well, how have you been forgiven? Well, partially, well, half the way, well, prove it to me first. No, none of those things are part of how God demands forgiveness of you. No, he offers it freely. He offers it because you ask for it, because you're sincere. So that's how you're supposed to forgive your spouse. And be a first repenter. Somebody says, well, I'm going to wait for them to apologize first. If they do it first, then okay, fine but I'm going to hold out. I'm just going to hold out. I can hold out like days, okay, until they say they're sorry. I'm not saying sorry until they say sorry because their sin is bigger than mine or they sinned first. What does it matter? What does it matter who sinned first? What does it matter whose sin is worse? If you were wrong, then admit it. Seek forgiveness. Admit you're a sinner. I know, and I can remember distinctly several times in my marriage where I knew I was wrong. And yeah, I, and I'm pretty sure she was worse. I, I'm pretty sure. Like if we had to like wait on a scale and there was like an outside observer and some cameras, you would have thought, yeah, she would probably was the bigger sinner here. But I was still wrong. And I was supposed to lead our home. And I, 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 I would wrestle my, I did not want to ask forgiveness. But I knew I was supposed to. And I just went in the other room and I just prayed, said, God, help me, help me to admit I'm wrong. Grant me repentance. Help me to want to reconcile with this woman that I love. And every time, every time the Lord granted that prayer. And I had to go back. I'm like, sweetheart, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. Here's what I did wrong. It was wrong. It was sinned against God. It sinned against you. And I don't want to do that anymore. Would you please forgive me? And you know what? That cold war, just start, cold war starts melting down. And there's just an ability to talk like there wasn't before just because I admitted I was wrong. Now, she's, she's watching to make sure I meant it. But she's also willing to forgive as well because she's been forgiven. So we're two sinners living together. Two sinners living together. So just remember, you married a sinner. And the sinner married you. And so because of the gospel, you should acknowledge your sin and you should seek forgiveness. And don't ratchet everything up to a sin category. Maybe it's just a forbearance category you can just overlook and move on and just enjoy life together.
So first gospel reminder, because of the gospel, remember that you are married to a sinner. And then the second thing I want to tell you today that you should remember because of the gospel is that you also married a saint. You married a saint. You might think I'm contradicting yourself here, Richard. Well, just stay with me here. Look back at the verse we just looked at in Colossians chapter 3. It says, put on then, in verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. You see, in the gospel, we are all made holy and we're all beloved by God. Our status before God is secure in Jesus Christ because of what he did for us, because he was willing to pay for our sin and remove the separation we had between us and the Father. There's there now no barrier between us and God, and we are accepted by him. We're not on the outs. There's nothing we can do to remove that uh, forgiveness. There's nothing we can do to reinstitute that condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been made holy. That's what the word saint means. We've been positionally before the Father accepted for all eternity. And because we have that status as accepted, as loved, as holy, therefore, we shouldn't expect our spouse to have to earn their status before us. Sometimes we treat them as though they need our approval. They didn't do something quite right. They didn't make the meal right. They didn't clean the house right. They didn't parent the kids right. They didn't pick the right job, and then you're upset at them because you're enforcing on them a performance expectation. They have to do something to earn your approval. They have to meet your standard of criteria. And all those things are antithetical to the gospel. They've already been accepted in the fullest way before God. What kind of acceptance are you demanding? Do you have a higher standard than God does? Has Christ not paid for their sin? Are they not holy and beloved? You see, this is somebody that Jesus died for. And they're loved and accepted. And Christ made them holy. And so after, the, after you make your marriage vows... That's a permanent commitment. And so here's a practical application of that. You, you should never, ever threaten divorce for your spouse. That, that should never even be a category. It doesn't matter. You could be in the worst fight in the world. You, you, it could be uh, the most awful thing said to each other, which I hope doesn't happen. Maybe, Lord help us not, it even gets physical. I hope not. But you should never, ever threaten divorce. That's not even a category. That's not even a realm of conversation because you made vows to each other before God. You accepted that person no matter what they've done, just like God's accepted us no matter what we've done in Jesus Christ. Why would you ever dangle that over your spouse as a weapon to be implored, employed against them? Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. And not just the big fights, but the little ones too. And that's where the silent treatment comes in. You're trying to ask them to earn back your favor. That's just making them do penance, to gain approval, as though they need your approval because they already have God's approval. And, you know, and even if it's not a fight, sometimes you can just drift apart relationally. You're just busy, they're busy. And um, again, I shared this with some of the young couples. I, it took me a while to figure out that um, you don't stay in neutral in marriage. See, I just thought, hey, whatever the last, like, relational deposit I made to my spouse, like, that should just hold over to the next time we're together. So it doesn't matter if, um, you know, we, we, you know, like, uh, we went on a date last week, and we have, it's been busy, we haven't really talked since then, and so all of a sudden, um, I'm expecting that we're in a, a, a certain mode of closeness as we're going to bed, and my wife lets me know, hey, she's not feeling as close to me as I'm feeling to her. And I'm like, well, what's the problem? I'm like, she's like, I'm just not feeling very connected. What do you mean not feeling connected? I didn't disconnect. When did you disconnect? When did that happen? She's like, no, like we just haven't spent much time together. We haven't talked very much. And so we just spread apart. And so I have to work to be close to her. And that's part of the communication and that's part of the acceptance. But there is a real relational component that happens because there's a drift in marriage if you aren't working to stay close, working to stay connected, working to unite your hearts. And so every day, there's just a simple daily check-in. Every day, there's a downloading of the day. There's a sharing of how you can pray for each other. Every day, 
there should be an opportunity to connect as much as possible. I know that's not always possible if you're out of town or traveling or something, emergency comes up, but that should be the goal. You're working towards that. And the things that sabotage this is critical comments. Look here in Colossians 3 as well. This is especially directed to the husband. Look at verse 19. It said, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, why does he go out of his way to say that? He doesn't say wives don't be harsh with your husbands. But he tells husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. Because I just think that's what's easy for guys to do. It's easy to be critical. It's easy to say, ah, I don't like something you're doing. Sometimes it, sometimes it could be almost un, 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 innocuous. You know, like, hey, you know, this house is pretty dusty. What's the plan for cleaning it? <laughs> um, well, shoot. Well, you, know, you might just meant it as like an observation, like there's dust in the house. She's hearing that personally. Like you just criticized her. Like she's not doing a good job. Or you come home and, um, and you know what? Dinner's not ready yet. And you're, like, you're already running late anyway. You're starving. You got somewhere to go that night. And you're like, hey, how come dinner's not ready? Well, did you not notice like she cleaned the whole house, helped all the kids with their homework, paid the bills, and some contractor came by and gave a hard time about something and she had to deal with that too. And then there was a phone call from like your mom that eats up half the day. And all that happened. <laughs> Some people, I think that's relevant, huh? <laughs> and, and, yet, and yet, you don't acknowledge any of that, and you're just like, hey, we got to go. Why isn't dinner ready? Well, that's, that's a critical comment, and it's not recognizing where they are, and it's making them feel like they have to earn status before you. This is a person that doesn't need your approval. They've already been accepted. So treat them in a way that honors them and respects them. And the other thing that can happen oftentimes is over time, you can start to develop a critical spirit towards your spouse. Um, my wife would share if she was here that um, the Lord did a work in her heart where she was, um, I was uh, doing things and she would recognize them unintentionally as uh, hurtful comments like, the one, like some of the examples I just gave. But over time, they build up and they wear away. And then she would start to say, you know what? I actually don't like that person very much. Yeah, I love them, but I don't really like them right now. And what happens is you start not assuming the best. And now you start interpreting everything. Well, why didn't he get off the couch and help me with the dishes? It must be because he doesn't want to serve me because he doesn't really love me. Well, I should get off the couch and help the dishes. I just didn't think of it. <laughs> I was just still thinking about work and my phone was buzzing and I should have put it away and I want to be more servant-minded. I'm growing in that and I want to be helpful to the kids. But if I didn't do that automatically, it doesn't automatically mean I don't love her. It doesn't automatically mean I don't care. But she has to assume the best, because 1 Corinthians 13 says, love hopes all things, love believes all things. And so you should always give your spouse the benefit of the doubt and not come with a critical spirit towards them. That's poison that just erodes your marriage. It just erodes your marriage if you let a critical spirit nestle into your heart towards your spouse. So one th practical thing that I've done and my wife's done and I encourage you is just to make a list of all the things you're thankful for about your spouse. Because sometimes if, when you think about your spouse, the, the first list that comes to your mind is all the things you don't like, all the things you're not happy about. Well, then you're dwelling on the wrong thing. There might be legitimate things you need to talk about, but I'd encourage you to make a list of all the things you're really thankful for. And allow that list with prayer and with the scripture to change your heart, to have a disposition of love, of hope, of believing the best of your spouse. It just makes the whole marriage interaction so much sweeter and so much easier. So don't have a critical eye, otherwise it'll poison your marriage. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another as you've been accepted in Jesus Christ. So because of the gospel, I'm encouraging you to accept one another because God's already accepted them. Accept them as who they are. You didn't marry them for who you hoped them to be, but for who they are. And God already loves them just the way they are. So accept them. Thirdly, you married a sinner, you married a saint, and because of the gospel, you've also married a sanctifier. You've married a sanctifier. Pastor Heath was talking about this in his talk. But even though you've accepted them as they are, God placed you in their life to help them grow. And God placed them in your life to help you grow. There's a purpose to marriage that, that, that means we're supposed to grow into the gospel more. We're supposed to become more like Christ as a result of being married. This is what Ephesians 5 is talking about when it says in verse 25 and following, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That, so that, there's a purpose. Verse 26 in Ephesians 5, there's a purpose. That he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of water of the word, so that he might present the, to the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. You're to play husbands a sanctifying role in your wife's life. And I would say wives to your husbands as well. Galatians 6.1 says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness when you see sin in their life. Or you think of a, a passage, well-known passage like uh, Matthew 18. When you see fault in your brother or sister, you're to con- show them their fault and speak to them about it and call them to repentance in a loving way and restore them. And the reason that you're supposed to play this role is because you live together. There's a proximity. This is the person that's going to see your sin better than anyone else. And you can try to ignore it. You can make them You can make them feel uncomfortable to bring it up. Say, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want you to bring that up in my life. I didn't ask you for your opinion. But all those things are wrong. I've heard of them all from married couples, and they they, they are short-circuiting the process for why that person's in your life. You should be asking your spouse, hey, where do you see sin in my life? Where can I grow? How can I become more like Christ? You see me every day. You see things. And if your wife's doing her job and husband, you're doing your job, you're going to be able to do that in a loving way that helps the other person. And you're not going to feel criticized about it because they're already accepted, right? You already know you're a sinner. So you've already acknowledged you're a sinner. You already know that you need to, uh, you're accepted before God. So now this makes it all the more easy. And I don't think, some people think that in order to sanctify your wife, this means that you have to do your devotions together every day. I just want to say about that. I don't think that's what that means. I know couples that do that. That's great. My wife and I tried that once or twice. It just didn't work for us. Okay? Uh, we just come at the Bible so very differently. So, but we do talk about the Bible, and we share what we've learned together, and we do pray together, and we encourage each other. But you can have your own time in the Word, and you can still be a sanctifying agent in your spouse's life. And husbands, you have to know that you are not the priest. You don't stand between her and God. She has her own relationship with God. You're there to be a spiritual encourager and a spiritual leader, and that means you're setting the priorities and you're initiating prayer and conversation around the things of the word and attendance at church and activities, but you, you don't mediate that between her and God. She has direct access. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not the man you, her husband. That's not the role you're to play in her life. But wives, too, can also, even with sinful husbands, win them without a word. Think of a passage like 1 Peter 3. This is primarily directed at unbelieving husbands, but I think for any husband who's sinning, it applies. 1 Peter 3 says, Likewise, wise, this is chapter 3, verse 1, 1 Peter, Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So wives, just by loving your husband and loving Jesus, and living in a spirit of obedience to his will and following his design for your marriage, you can win him. You can be a sanctifying agent in his life. You can help him become more like Christ. And husbands, likewise, I think the best way for you to do that is just demonstrating a life of service and sacrifice. Dying to yourself every day, like we just heard about. So, I think, again, another practical way, just trying to help boil these concepts down to practical ways, I think one of the ways you can help initiate this in your marriage is just to share with your spouse some ways that you've seen Christ work in their life. Say, hey, sweetheart, I just want to share with you, you know, we've been married for this many years, and here's some ways I think you're more like Christ now than I think you were before. And I just want to encourage you by that. And I want to know how you've helped me. Here's some ways that I think I've grown and the ways you've helped me. My wife is so good about just letting me know, hey, sweetheart, I think um, there's some things in your life that um, you're not thinking about or some ways you're not honoring Christ. And would you, be, would you let me talk to you about that? Sometimes if she just launches into it and I'm not ready for it, I, I don't respond the best. I wish I did. But when she sets it up that way, hey, can we talk? There's some things I'm seeing in your life I think you want to know about that I'm just more receptive. So you know your spouse. You know how to get into that conversation. 
And wives, sometimes those buffer words or planning a time to talk make all the difference. And husbands, when your wife works up the courage to want to talk to you about your sin, don't snap back at them. Don't be defensive. They're doing what they're supposed to do because you married a sanctifier. The person lying next to you at night is, be, is meant to be there to help you become more like Christ. So you married a saint, you married a sinner, and you married a sanctifier. Fourthly, because of the gospel, you also married a servant leader and a submissive helper. This is what we've just been talking about. But there's a, there's a gospel structure, there's a choreography to how men and women are to relate to husband and wives in a marriage context. It's not just a free-for-all. You don't just get to do whatever you want. Husbands are to be the head and wives the followers. In the Genesis creation, it's, it's uh, built into creation itself. God made Adam first and then made Eve from Adam's rib as a helper fit for him, to come alongside him, to help him. So a husband should be a servant leader and a, submiss- and a wife should be a submissive helper. And there's two, other, there's two ways you can fall off the wagon here. So for husbands, sometimes you can fall off the wagon by being kind of a tyrant, a bit of a dictator, being harsh, being abusive in your words or your actions, and thinking you get to just make all the decisions without any input from your wife, or you get to tell her what to do. But there's an opposite danger too. Sometimes the way husbands aren't a servant leader is by being passive, being a wimp. They give in to passivity, and they're not really leading at all. And that's not helpful either. That's also abdicating your role as a servant leader. And wives as well. You can fall off the wagon two ways too. You can be a doormat and just let your husband just do everything. You never say anything, you never speak up, you never point out a sin, you never disagree, you never ask to talk. You just let him, you just are an accomplice in his tyrannical behavior. Or you can try to usurp it. Hey, he's not stepping up, so I gotta step up. He's not leading the family devotion, so I gotta do it. He's not making the decision to go to church, so I'm gonna get all the kids together. Well, there's there's a difficulty there if you're married to an unbelieving spouse, but by and large, the husband, here's a real real practical way to know, know if you're leading in your home. Who in your home is the one who most often says let's? Let's, let's go out to eat. Let's go to church. Let's watch a movie. Let's go play a game with the kids. Let's take a walk together. Let's go on a date. Who's the one that initiates that most? Is it the wife or is it the husband? That simple phrase of let's do this. Men, husbands, that's your job to initiate. I'm never saying there's never a time a wife can suggest an idea if you haven't done it. But if the pattern in your marriage is your wife is always the one initiating, all the time for everything you're doing, then you're abdicating your leadership role. You're not serving her. You're being passive. Be the initiator. Say, let's. Let's talk about the Bible, sweetheart. Let's pray together. Let's bring our kids to church. Let's make a decision to go to bed at a good time so we can be early tomorrow to serve. Let's go serve in the nursery. But if she's the one bringing up all the time, then she's just gonna feel like she's fighting upstream going to feel like she's nagging you and you're just the passive one and she feels like she's got to usurp your authority so be the initiator and you'll serve you both plan for your marriage and plan for your family there's a beautiful symmetry that comes when complementary roles are fitting together and as a as the gospel is manifested in your life husbands will lead and wives will follow good godly leadership there's a place to disagree. Heath's illustration with the dog is a perfect illustration of that. Because even in that conversation, Lauren still affirmed his leadership, said she's willing to follow, but also was able to speak respectfully and clearly that I disagree. And you're not following, you're not doing this rightly, and we need to talk some more. That's the exact way that a wife can bring up disagreements with her husband. So, you married a sinner, you married a saint, you married a sanctifier. You married a servant leader and you married a submissive helper. And lastly, finally, you also married a sister or a brother. This is actually really important if you think about this in marriage. Sometimes we can elevate the importance of marriage to be something actually more than it's not. Here we are having a whole marriage conference about why marriage matters and we're talking about the importance of marriage and the purpose of marriage and all this is so true. But that person you married, if you're a man, 
If they were in Christ and you were in Christ before you got married, they were your sister in Christ before you got married, and they're going to be your sister in Christ after you're married and for all eternity. And for women, that man you married, if you married in the Lord, was your brother in Christ before you got married, and he'll be your brother in Christ after you're married too. Because the Bible says in Matthew 22, 30, that marriage is not forever. In the resurrection, we're neither given or taken in marriage. We'll be like the angels. Not that we'll get spiritual bodies devoid of a physical being, but there's no marriage anymore. Because marriage had a purpose. Marriage had a purpose to point to the relationship of Christ and the church and the redemption that's now finalized in the resurrection. When Jesus comes back, there's no need to point to that anymore because we're experiencing it all as we all are in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage has a momentary purpose in light of all eternity. In light of the billions and billions and trillions of years that you're alive for all eternity, the 50 or 60 years that you're married is but a blink of an eye. Don't lose the purpose of marriage. Don't lose the larger picture. If Jesus Christ paid for your spouse's sin and brought them in as a daughter or son of the king, then they are your brother or sister and Jesus your older brother for all eternity. And that's the relationship that's going to last. That's the relationship you're going to have with them for all eternity as a brother or sister and no longer a spouse. The 50 or 60 or so years that you might have the opportunity to be married, you're a custodian of that person for all the things we just listed. But that's not the ultimate relationship. The ultimate relationship is the one with God for his glory. And your marriage is to point to him. Your marriage is to bring him glory, not your own glory. Not your own selfishness. All those things miss the purpose of marriage. God's glory is the goal of marriage. And Christ's love for the church is how that glory is demonstrated. So as you live out your marriage, you keep all these daily gospel reminders in view every day. Remember that ultimately, your purpose is not yourself. Your purpose is God's glory. And this marriage will pass until death do us part. In Romans 7, you were released from the bonds of marriage in death. But you'll be spiritually united with your brother or sister for all eternity. 1 Peter 3, 1, uh, 3 7 says that your spouse is a co-heir of the grace of life. A co-heir. This is the person you're going to be reigning with for all eternity. So treat them well now. Because they'll be your brother or sister for all eternity. For God's glory. I pray that you can put some of these practical things to work in your marriage. I hope after this time together you can see how the gospel makes a difference in changing who we are and what we do in our marriage. And in light of the gospel, we recognize who you're married. It might not be who you thought it was. But you've married a sinner. You've married a saint. You've married a sanctifier. You've married a servant leader or a submissive helper. And you married a spiritual sister or brother in the Lord. That's who you married. And that's who the Lord wants you to honor him in all that you do. Let's thank him together. Oh, Father, I pray for all of us here today that you would allow the gospel to fundamentally change the way we think about our spouse. We recognize that it's not about us and what we want, but it's about your glory and our holiness to please you. I pray that you would do a supernatural work to help us see in ways that we might have might undermine in that every day. Help us to draw fresh mercy that you promised to give us in the gospel because Jesus not only saved us, but he sanctifies us. He not only brought us into your kingdom, but he's going to carry us through to completion. He began this good work and he'll not leave us till the day of redemption. Help us all, Father, to grow in our love for Jesus and our desire for his glory to be manifested in our marriage so that we can love our spouse as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.